So Penn State Wrestling goes out and breaks the NCAA tournament record for the most points scored by a team. And that's not even the most interesting storyline from the weekend. You are Locked On Nittany Lions, your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, Penn State set the NCAA team scoring record. The points margin was 100 from the second place finish of Cornell. And Penn State finishes with four individual champs. And I feel like it's just, it's par for the course. There's other things to focus on from the NCAA finals. This is Locked On Nittany Lions. I'm your host, Zach Seiko. And thanks so much for making us your first listen and watch every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast. And today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That is linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. Joe Smelter is back. Nittany Sports now beat reporter for football, men's basketball, wrestling to add another element to this recap of the NCAA finals, looking at the season and then what's to come for Penn State wrestling with the Olympic trials and then just how crowded the lineup's going to be in 24 and 25. Joe, I, yes, Penn State set all these, acc- you know, reached all these accolades, set these records, eight All-Americans, the points record, four individual champions. And it, it just seems like, yeah, Penn State did that. It, it's, it, it's impressive, but they're going to raise the bar even further next season. So that's why I want to focus things like Carter Starachi, man, when he took off his leg brace, and I know that was his way of telling you, I beat you in this state. I beat you like this. He took down two former NCAA champions along the way and just had and just won the way he had to. But the fact that he shut out, right? He didn't just win. He shut out Makai Lewis. He shut out Shane Griffith. And that leg, we with what Bo Nichols said on social media and, and from what Carter, you know, no comment about the potential of an ACL injury or anything like that. This wasn't some simple hyperextended knee. And the fact that Carter was still as dominant as he was all the way through and won a fourth national title is just nothing short of impressive here. Yeah, Zach, and I think uh, after he beat Makai Lewis, it was pretty inevitable what was to come. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because after Thursday, like, we didn't know. Carter won his matches Thursday, but he was taken down in his first match, which had never happened before um, in the season. Uh, So you're going against a... Former national champion uh, in Makai Lewis, who was seated number one, obviously would not have been seated number one if Carter uh, didn't go through what he went through. Right. Um, but still, uh, that's a guy who uh, is very formidable, uh, to say the least. Uh, and mm-hmm. you didn't really know what was going to happen in that match. But then I think by the end of the first period, uh, we kind of knew it's like, all right. Carter's maybe he won't tech fall anybody. He's not going to score the way we're used to seeing him scoring. Sure. But he he's not he's not going to give any ground either. And he shut out Makai Lewis, shut out Shane Griffith, and then uh, ended shut out up, Rocco Welsh. I ended up shutting out Rocco Welsh at the end. Yeah, and yep. uh, just I I think the thing that and I've seen people bring this up on social media too, um, the mental game of Carter Starachi is second to none. Like that guy's mentality, uh, his interview with Quinn Kesnick after I, I believe it was uh, the Lewis match where he was saying uh, that there's no setback. The only setbacks um, are the ones that um, mm-hmm. kind of creep into your mind yeah. or something to that effect. And Carter just never let, never let it get into his mind. And you can see that on what he did on the mat. So um, mm-hmm. I would attribute uh, Carter's uh, success this week really to how much of a mental stronghold he has on everybody else, not just in him not letting the injury affect him uh, and beat him mentally, uh, but in uh, the guys that he wrestles, I think he's able to get into their heads too and able to kind of have that presence to where they know uh, that they're wrestling the best. Uh, And they kind of, I don't know how much guys that are wrestling Carter Starachi believe that they can beat Carter Starachi. I think he gets into their heads Mm -hmm. kind of the way that, Mike Tyson early in his career would get in the people's heads before he would even fight yeah. them. So I think Carter is just that type of athlete where he's great physically, but mentally he is just a whole nother level. And because of that, when he wasn't at his best physically and clearly he wasn't, uh, he was still able uh, to win a national championship because 
largely, I think, um, of the metal aspect. I mean, it's all inferior competition to him. If you ask him, they're all inferior. But like I said, Shane Griffith is a former NCAA champ. But Kai Lewis is a former NCAA champ and was denied those other opportunities because of Carter Storacci. Ever since Carter Storacci stepped on campus at Penn State, it has been the 174-pound weight class has been his all along. And it doesn't matter if he's 100%. It doesn't matter if he's 75. It doesn't matter if he's 50. It doesn't matter if he's 10%, Joe. It really doesn't. Carter has owned this bracket for the longest time. And that's why it is up in the air because for most people, I think just for about everybody, it would be appealing to get that fifth NCAA title. But when Carter's that just better, better. Imagine if he was on a fully healthy leg. Imagine if he never had to sustain that injury against Edinburgh. Who knows? Again, because he shut out Makai Lewis in that all-star meet. It was 10 to nothing the last time they met beforehand. So this was a very reserved Carter. He knew what he had to do. It is chestnut checkers, like he said. You can win any sort of way, but when you challenge the king, you best not miss. And Carter, Carter ends up, of course, taking that fourth national title. And then it'll be seen. He He's non-committal. He says he doesn't know if he's going to come back for a fifth. Uh, so it'll be interesting. But I, I don't know that he will because he's made it very clear that he just doesn't like school. And he's very interested in focusing on the Olympics and the MMA. How can you do that if he's wrestling collegiately? That will take uh, another element as well, Joe. Yeah, and he uh, kind of, uh, he might have let slip um, in his press conference that he had just wrestled um, his last folk-style match. Uh, but that that kind of taken with a grain of salt because if you watch sure. his uh, interview with Quinn Kessnich um, after the 2023 championships uh, when he got that pin yeah. over Mike Diabriola and won, he basically, he all but announced uh, that he was done with Penn State and Nitty Sports Now kind of uh, wrote an article, uh, uh, not Nitty Sports Now, I wrote the article, I'll kind of uh, take the fall here, but I, I can't really take a fall because like Carter basically said all but said that he wasn't going to come back and i i wrote it a road call as such and then obviously he decides to come back but uh yeah i i can't really see uh carter being back i don't see the benefit um i don't think i don't think he's a guy that really wants to be known as somebody who stayed in college wrestling forever um i don't think he would want that to be part of his legacy and also what if he doesn't win what if his last match ends up being a loss and instead of going out as a four-time champ which only uh, five guys had done beforehand. He goes out as a guy that got upset in the semifinals or the finals, the way Spencer Lee did. Uh, there's just a lot of risk involved. Um, I did see mm -hmm. a good point in how if Carter wants to get into an MMA career, um, which I think is yep. quite possible, if not likely, he'd be able to market himself as the only five time champ in wrestling history. That was an yeah. interesting theory, but I don't, I think. If Carter wants to go that down that road, I mean, we see we see how well Bo Nichols marketed himself. I think Carter could mm -hmm. do something very issues. similar. Uh, he can do something very similar in the UFC if he wanted. He can obviously the Olympic trials are coming up. We'll talk about that. Uh, he can still have a career yep. in freestyle too. Uh, there's just uh, really no reason I don't think for Carter uh, to stay uh, and go for a fifth title. Um, I think he's wrestled his last match at Penn State, and I think it's certainly. Uh, this one, um, it was interesting. Carter also said in his press conference that after Carter won that the title as a freshman, uh, mm -hmm. Kale told him this is the easiest one you're going to get, basically. And Carter didn't believe him at the time, but the last one was definitely the toughest, um, all contacts considered. Really? Um, and it's just, yes, it's, it's a heck of a way to go out. And, um, I think, uh, that. Uh, Carter Sirachi has made his mark on Penn State wrestling, made his mark well before this tournament or this season even. Um, but now uh, the, it, it really is a storybook ending, and I think uh, and I think it, it's just the perfect way for him to go out. This is the last element that I'll add to it, and then I want to get your thoughts on the Jordan Burroughs comment who was on the ESPN broadcast team. I, the, for him to come back for a fifth title, means that there is another giant to take down. Like, he's taken them all down. Labriola, as you mentioned, in years past, and then Makai Lewis multiple times, Shane Griffith. The Shane Griffith beat him in high school, so that probably had to feel good for Carter Storacci. Eight years later, back in 2016, gets to exact his revenge for Griffith beating him that one time at the high school level. But there's, no, there's nobody else. There's nobody else to challenge him, so... What is the point of coming back for a fifth title other yeah. than yes, you get the you know, you get the recognition, but you're not gonna beat anybody because 
Shane Griffith is moving on. Makai Lewis is going to be moving on. You already know you're better than Rocco Welsh. Who's left in that 174 pound weight class that you're like, well, he's up and coming. So you have to take him out as well. Carter knows that he's better than everybody else. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you said it. Um, and Rocco Welsh, I'm assuming Carter does leave is, I think he's going to be a multi-time national champ. Uh, there's could. no reason, yeah. no reason not to think that. I thought he, he knows he's better Carter. than him. There's yeah. nobody else. And, yeah. And Rocco and Welsh wrestled Carter pretty well. I fought at rec hall. Um, at least relative to how most people wrestle Carter. And mm -hmm. I thought he wrestled Carter well last night, but um, it just wasn't in the cards. But I think uh, much like Mitchell Messenbrink, who we'll talk about, I think yeah. uh, Rocco Welsh's day um, is uh, going to be pretty soon and probably going to be as soon um, as next March in uh, Philadelphia. He's uh, in his home state too. Uh, yeah, uh, he's, he's my early pick uh, to win at 174 for uh, 2025. We'll take a quick time out on the show, address the Jordan Burroughs comment, as well as you mentioned it. Yes, Mitchell Messenbrink, as well as some other overall season takeaways with the impressive performances of guys like Tyler Kasak. And then down the road, the 2024-2025 lineup could be really crowded, especially if Carter does decide to change his idea of coming back for a fifth NCAA title. We're discussing that more next here on Locked On Nittany Lions. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest. And just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. How about the North Carolina Tar Heels? They can only be described as an armada. This one seed is as hardcore as it gets out there. So no wonder they've secured a spot in the Sweet 16 this Thursday against Alabama in the NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament. They're a favorite pick by many to make a run at the championship. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop all of them and more right now at NissanUSA.com. That's NissanUSA.com. Today's episode is sponsored by FanDuel, the official sports book of Locked On. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a number one seed, it's time to go dancing on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet is a winner. That's $200 in bonus bets to use on point spreads, money lines, totals. You can even pick who's going to win it all. All you got to do is visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet college hoops until they cut down the net. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day long? Do you ever have to turn down the volume with all of that shouting? How about you make the switch to Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all of that screaming, without all of the yelling. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news, streaming 24-7 on YouTube and on the free Fire TV channels app, courtesy of Amazon. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And if you want to keep up with what Joe does, you can follow him on X and you can also check out his articles at nittanysportsnow.com. Let's get back into it with, with Carter and uh, specifically the Jordan Burroughs comment saying that, oh, now that he knows uh, how unhealthy the leg is or how not strong it is, you know, make whatever assumptions you want because we truly, since we don't have a comment, we don't know if it's an ACL injury. We uh, It seems like we were wrong about the hyperextended knee injury and that it's a lot worse and you spend time in the hospital. So Carter was very transparent about all of that. I think it was one last jab at the competition to say like, Hey, this is what I went through and you still couldn't touch me. You still couldn't beat me. But then Jordan Burroughs takes that former Nebraska wrestler and he's a, you know, Olympic champion, world champion, right? A collegiate champion. He, he, he has the pedigree of a lifetime, but Joe, and this is Bo Nickel made a comment back at this because Jordan said, Hey, if I know that that knee is really bad, I'm going after that if I happen to match up with him in the Olympic trials. I, I, I err on the side of what Bo said, like, keep those thoughts to yourself. Like, I okay, all is fair in love and war, and I guess in an extent, competition and sports can be, you know, fall under that war category. I'm not trying to get into an ethical debate here, okay, or a historical debate. But sports is competition. The survival of the fittest win at the end of the day. 
And yeah, other competition across internationally are, are going to target Carter's bad knee if he's not 100% healthy. But Jordan Burroughs to make a comment like that, uh, what does, are there any consequences for that, Joe? No, I don't think there need to be any consequences. I think, um, as you said, it was maybe not something he should have said on the air. Um, yeah. But I think there's um, a lot of validity uh, to what he was saying because uh, somebody who knows a lot about uh, freestyle wrestling um, is Kurt Angle, right? And uh, mm -hmm. Olympic gold medalist from 1996. I was watching, mm -hmm. I forget the name of the documentary, but it's Kurt Angle's uh, life story, basically, uh, sure. produced by WWE on Peacock. And he was saying how, um, obviously, it's well documented how he won the gold medal with a broken freaking neck, uh, quote unquote. And when he was wrestling in the Olympics, guys were going after his neck and uh, Kurt was explaining it. And I don't remember him uh, calling out the guys he was wrestling and saying it was a dirty tactic or anything like that. I What I got from Kurt explaining that was, all right, um, that was Olympic wrestling. That was part of the game. I was hurt. These guys are trying um, to get something uh, that's literally a lifelong dream or uh, something people dream about and they're going to do whatever it takes. Um, and if that meant going after um, my broken neck, uh, that's just what they're going to do. And I have to adjust to it. Now uh, I'm not going to say Bo Nichols wrong because uh, I think, yeah, if I'm um, basically, uh, you know, saying that um, going after somebody's injury is dirty. Um, I don't, I don't think there's a problem with uh, not agreeing uh, with what Burr said and not agreeing with that tactic. Um, I don't know. I kind of see both ends to it. Um, I also think it's worth uh, pointing out that Bo Nickel, uh, much like Curtis Durachi, um, is a bit of a showman on social media. Uh, sure. They both make their thoughts known, and they both um, – I'm not going to say they're not genuine, uh, but I think they mm -hmm. both say things uh, knowing that it's going to get a reaction, and that's why – Bo has done very well um, in getting um, promoted and hyped up uh, by the UFC. Um, and that's yeah. why Carter could do very well um, in that field if that's where he choose if that's where he chooses to go. Uh, so uh, yeah, I thought um I, I thought uh Bo's response was interesting. I thought Jordan Burroughs' response about how Bo punches people in the face for a living. <laughs> yeah. uh, that that was pretty entertaining. Uh but yeah, I, I don't think uh I don't know if there's any legitimate uh, bad blood between Bo and Jordan Burroughs. So, um, I don't think it's really that serious. I mean, it's just Twitter. Come on now. But, yeah, uh, yeah I, I definitely feel that Bo uh, meant what he said. Uh, Burroughs meant what he said. And um, I can't speak too much about uh, tactics um, in Olympic wrestling. But um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's really a secret that when guys get hurt, the other guy's probably going to target um, that injury. Uh, but, um, is it something uh, that should have been said on the air? Uh, no, no, probably yeah. not. And I don't really blame Jordan Burroughs for thinking it. I blame him a little bit for saying it. Uh, and I and I think Bo Nichols' response uh, was fine too. Um, I don't know if really anything should be read too deeply into it one way or yeah. the other. And then Penn State had four individual NCAA champions. I felt like Mitchell Messenbrink, I mean, and Bo Bartlett and Mitchell Messenbrink were as close, truly, as they could have been to being that fifth or that sixth person at the top of the podium, especially with Mitchell Messenbrink, Joe. To see the scoreboard, eight to eight, I understand. But then, you know, I'm I'm watching it on TV and I'm like, okay, Mitchell's not making an attack. Is, is What is he waiting for? Is he waiting for Carr to back away, get that extra stalling point? What's going on here? And he just holds him at arm's length. And I'm like, Oh, he, he thinks that it's tied. Does he really think this is tied? And then kind of similar to Brayden Davis looking for that stalling call against the eventual champion and Figueroa out of Arizona state, a similar situation here where what, what, what's the disconnect, Joe? I, is that on the coaching staff? Is that on Mitchell Messenbrink for not realizing that, Hey, you've been ridden out over the course of this match for two minutes. I, I got to think that Messenbrink's got to be a little more aware. Maybe he's not hearing the coaches. Does he go, you know, I understand being in the moment as an athlete like that, but you have four coaches in the corner. You mean to tell me someone didn't say you got to go, go, go. So I, I put this a little more on Messenbrink, but Hale Sanderson did own up and say, as coaches, we need to do a better job. Yeah. And, and Kale's obviously going to say that he's not going to throw his wrestler under the bus, but no. Um, this is obviously this, I don't think this is going to be remembered, um, 
for throughout the ages the way Chris Weber's uh, timeout against uh, North Carolina was. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think there's some similarities. Um, it's a mental gaffe. And yeah. uh, in watching, uh, I don't know if you've probably – I hope you've seen the Fab Five documentary, Zach. Um, if you haven't have. by now, uh, yeah. So you, know, you might remember uh, them explaining that Steve Fisher, the head coach, stressed uh, pretty heavily during uh, one of the timeouts. I don't know if it was the media or if it was a timeout on the floor, but he stressed to Michigan's bench, "We don't have any timeouts left." Um, but Brian Dutcher, who was an assistant for Fisher, now the head coach at San Diego State, said in the documentary, "It's like, yeah, he says that." But this is a national championship. Who knows what these kids are thinking about? And I think that's kind of what probably happened with Mitchell Messenbrink, right? You, you mentioned there's four coaches. It's the best coaching staff in America by far. It is. Somebody had, had to have said something. And I think what the most likely outcome was Kale or whoever was yelling it, maybe multiple people at the same time were yelling it. And Messenbrink uh, didn't pro – for whatever reason, didn't tunnel. process. I think a little bit of tunnel that. vision, tunnel vision, yeah. if you will. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's the most likely re result. Um, I don't know. Um, I'll have to read more into uh, why this is how it is, but I kind of think the writing time point, and this isn't making an excuse for Messenbrink, but the writing time point, maybe that should be added just on the scoreboard right away and not at the end. Um, I'm, yeah. I would be a proponent of that. Uh, but yeah, I think this is just as simple as uh, – there's a lot going on. Uh, the coaches absolutely said something. Um, I 100% believe mm -hmm. that, and it just didn't process. And that's really what it was. And I like the way Mitchell Messerbrink's handled, handled this so far, mm -hmm. writing uh, – you wrote a post on early Sunday morning today where mm -hmm. concluding this, basically saying it's like, uh, yep, I fell short, but I'll be back. Uh, that was the gist of it. And that's yeah. what you got to do. You got to move on. Uh, he knows that uh, Keegan O'Toole and David Carr are going to be gone. Uh, he knows that, assuming mm -hmm. he stays at 165 – He's right. going to be the man uh, going into next season, just like Levi Haynes uh, was number one coming into 157 this year and never gave that up on his way to winning a national title. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, Mitchell Messenbrink's going to be fine. And um, as long as he's able to get a national title and probably multiple national titles, uh, this this will be forgotten about. Uh, it, it won't, As I said, it won't be a Chris Weber thing where, you know, every everybody talks about it for the rest of the time. I mean, in, in an NCAA final, that's just, it, it's hard to accept it, especially since Mitchell Messenbrink was the better wrestler in that. I know David Carr's the champion. I know he's friends, good friends with Aaron Brooks and his family. But when I watched that match and watching it back again, one more time, just to kind of take in what actually happened, Messenbrink was the aggressor from start to finish. Sure, David Carr had some counters, but who had, who was, you know, more tired out? Who was out of gas? David Carr. Yes, Carr was out of gas. And I've already made that joke, but yes, exactly, mm -hmm. pun intended. Mitchell Messenbrink landed more shots, better shots. Now, did David Carr, you know, ride, ride him out, secure the riding time point? Absolutely. But I think if, if Messenbrink was able to maybe take one or two more shot attempts at Carr in those final 20 seconds, he wins by, you know, in, on a, on a last second buzzer beater, essentially to take the NCAA championship. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's, uh, kind of a shout out to David Carr a little bit, cause we thought it was going to mm -hmm. be probably Keegan O'Toole's tournament coming in and, yep. uh, unrelated to Penn State that, where do you kind of rank the Keegan O'Toole, David Carr rivalry just in history ever in college wrestling? It's got, it's gotta be pretty high. Um, you know, <laughs> There aren't too many team rivalries, I don't think, uh, in wrestling sure. as, as relative to other sports. Uh, but individually, uh, what those two did uh, was just absolutely um, awesome. Uh, but yeah, in uh, watching uh, in watching mm -hmm. that match, I'm, I agree. I think uh, it wasn't really a case where Messenbrink was down big against, like he was against Dean Hamney and had to come back. I thought he was right there with him, uh, and uh, you know he was um, definitely aggressive, and I would agree with uh, your your assessment of that. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it'll de it's definitely going to sting uh, for a long time, but judging by how Messenbrink's brings handle this so far, I think it's going to be something that he allows to fuel him instead of something that would stay with him for all the wrong reasons. So the 2024, 25 lineup could be overcrowded. And that's assuming that while well, Carter's airing away from coming back, what if he does come back? What about Bo Bartlett, Greg Kirkfleet? And then all the talented freshmen are coming in. That's going to create a lot of log jams. 
in that Penn State lineup. It's a good problem to have, but how did the Nittany Lions and Kale Sanderson sort it out? Let's discuss that on the other side of this break. Today's episode is also brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. And LinkedIn does all of that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing a lot of hats and might not have the time or the resources to hire. LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even quicker. 2.5 million, that is right, 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. So be one of them. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And remember, if you're not already, become an everyday or subscribe to Locked on Nittany Lions on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts for the latest conversations around your favorite Penn State sports teams. You can keep up with Joe on X. You can follow him there. Also check out his articles at NittanySportsNow.com. And in this final segment, the 24-25 lineup is really going to be crowded, and Carter Storacci could come back. Bo Bartlett could come back. Greg Kirkley could come back. Now, Bo Bartlett didn't walk at senior day, so I feel a little more inclined to say that he is going to come back. Kirkley and Storacci did, so that one is a little more up in the air, but they could choose to come back, especially since I think Penn State does need a heavyweight wrestler. I'm not exactly sure who would take that spot. But where it gets really crowded, and this is why, you know, bringing up names like Tyler Kasak and what Brayden Davis did, right? There's young wrestlers that really stood out this season. We know the anchors that are Levi Haynes and Mitchell Messenbrink. Aaron Brooks is gone. But, oh, there's Josh Barr. Oh, there's Alex Facundo coming back. But at the lower weights, Joe, 125, 133, 141, starting with that third of the lineup, you have Luke Lilladol coming in. You have Brayden Davis who returns. You have Aaron Nagal. You have Bo Bartlett. What what do you do? And then Tyler Kasak also, I mean, you could include the 149 dilemma with Shane Van Ness recovering from injury. And then Kasak was supposed to be 141. And look how he did taking third, moving up an entire weight class. So this is, it gets really, really crowded here with the idea. And then so what? Does Kasak redshirt? What does Davis redshirt? Do you bench Nagal? I, I I don't know what you do here because Luke Lilladol is really talented. I know he has to earn it when he gets there, but this is, and Bo Bartlett coming back at 141, obviously he would be the best of the bunch. He would beat Kasak head to head. I would imagine he would beat Nagao if you move Nagao to 141. So what exactly does Penn State do here since you don't, you have a depth chart, but it's not like football when it, when it comes to wrestling. Yep. You have 10 starters and that's, that's it. You have 10 starters. Yeah, and I I don't mean any disrespect to Bo Bartlett, but he would almost make life a little easier uh, for Kale Sanderson by not coming back, because then you could end up just putting Kasak and Van Nessa both in the lineup with really not a lot of drama. Uh, But yeah, let's saying that Bo does come back, uh, who knows what you do? Um, And it's going to be really interesting, especially as you said in the lower weights, where I think Aaron Nagal was going to have to earn it. I'm not saying that I would bench him, but I think he's going to have a lot to prove, uh, not only the chip that's on his shoulder uh, by not repeating as an All-American, but just getting back into the starting lineup because it's not going to be easy to tell the Big Ten champion and the guy that came in as the number one wrestler in the country on that 125 in the NCAA tournament that he's got a redshirt and take a year off. Uh, That's going to be very difficult, um, especially considering... uh, Davis uh, could easily uh, bulk up, and I think he's probably going to have to bulk up regardless. Yeah, he and, almost has to. He, yeah. there's, it, 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 he's going to move to 133 at some point. Yeah, and uh, Kale could easily look and say, okay, I got a potential uh, stud coming in in a Lily doll who you mentioned. Can throw him a 125. Brayden's got a, for health purposes, got to bulk up, um, throw him a 133. 
Uh, somebody's got to sit, and maybe until he proves otherwise, Aaron Nagel is going to have to be that guy um, to take a back seat. Um, and this this is a very good wrestler, to be clear. I think he showed that a lot of times in the regular season. Showed that at the Big Ten Championships uh, by coming within a hair of getting to that title match at 133. And I think if he beats Ragerson, he's probably your champ at 133. Uh, and then even at the NCAA Championships, I thought he responded – pretty nicely from losing that first match. I mean, ended up coming one win away uh, from being an All-American. But uh, that's kind of the price you pay uh, when you transfer to Penn State is that uh, it's very hard to have a secure spot. And I think that goes to the case. I think the fact that we're that uh, you're mentioning um, redshirting Brian Davis, potentially. I'm mentioning benching Aaron Nagal, potentially. We both agree that redshirting the guy that finished third, Tyler Kasak at 149, could be red shirted. Uh, it, it just, it's pretty crazy. And we're not even yeah. taking into account uh, the transfers uh, that are going to mm-hmm. want to go to Penn State. You got to think there's yeah. going to be a portal guy in there somewhere. Um, Cause I don't think Kale's going to look at what Mitchell Messenbrink has done and look at what adding him to the roster um, has yep. done for uh, this Penn State uh, program and say, I don't want to add any more transfers. I think that's something he is absolutely uh, going uh, to look into. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, that 125 for 149 is just, um, an absolute mess. I think after that, it gets a little easier. I think, uh, Alex Facundo is a pretty good candidate, uh, to, uh, take Kurt Sirachi's spot at 174. 174. Uh, and if, if that happens, you can kind of, uh, maybe, Swap uh, Messenbrink and Levi Haynes. Um, then a 184, I think Josh Barr is a pretty solid uh, choice. He'll, he'll, he'll replace Bernie Truex at 184. And then Lucas Cochran, Lucas Cochran at 197, Cochran. unless you get a transfer. And who knows what happens at the heavyweight position if Greg Kirkfleet goes, maybe a transfer there too. But yes. uh, yeah, yeah, I think going back to last year, um, it was pretty obvious uh, what was going to what was going to take place, obviously, uh, you didn't know who would replace Roman Bravo Young. You didn't know who would mm-hmm. be at 125. But everything else was pretty straightforward with the swipe tweak of Aaron Brooks going to 197 to make room for Bernie Truex. But, yeah. but yeah, this is going to be – I feel this is going to make for a much more interesting offseason uh, combined with what the current slash former Penn State wrestlers are going to do at the Olympic trials and what Kale and company are going to do with the lineup in general – this off season uh, is going to be going to be a pretty good one, and I think it's going to be kind of a blessing uh, for Nittany Sports now. You know, whenever spring football is done, uh, and there's that kind of spring early summer lull. Um, talking mm-hmm. about what wrestling is going to do in the lineups is going to fill a lot of that lull, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm also looking mm-hmm. forward to seeing what current slash former Penn State athletes are going to do uh, at the Olympic trials less than a month from now. Yes. Yeah, the Olymp- yeah, the Olympic trials are coming up uh, towards the middle, late end of April. They're April 19th, 20th in State College, and all of the NCAA champs qualify, and then you still have to you still have to wrestle through if you're going if you did not if you came up short, and then all the other competitors as well. That's you know, that's gonna be the best of the best wrestling in all of the United States, truly, because of everyone and who can, you know, who can compete. I saw the 64 kilogram class and the way that it was stacked through of what the, what the bracket would potentially look like. And it was just, it was just insane to me, but yeah, the, the 24, 25 lineup uh, is going to be interesting in that respect of, and then what happens, right? Kirk, say Kirk Fleet comes back. Bartlett too, even though I think he's the most likely to do that, but all three, and then Carter Sirachi. At 174. So then what do you do with Alex Facundo, right? What do you do with all the all these different other wrestlers? Because then does Facundo move up to 184? Does Josh Barr move to 197? What does that mean for Cochran? Right. So, and then in this age of the transfer portal, there can be a lot of a lot of moving pieces. So I'm just really intrigued to see what and it's not like football where you can have two, three running backs, you know, four, five, six wide receivers. You have One starter, and yes, you need somebody behind them in case, you know, injury, illness, fatigue, whatever you have, but you don't get to make any subs in the middle of a wrestling match. You wrestle or you don't. That's really how it works here. So when there's only 10 spots up for grab, yeah, this is a big deal. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's a very big deal, and it's... uh... It's, uh, I'm going to start looking at potential transfers. We, we saw a lot yeah. of them 
um, over this past weekend, and I, I have a hard time. I will predict that at least one, maybe more of Penn State starters next season is going to be a transfer because that's that's how it's been uh, in the past years. You know, you saw what Max Dean did in his time at Penn State. Michael Beard Mexico. leaving. Yeah. Yeah. That's the break who we mentioned, uh, what Bernie Truax did this year. He, Bernie Truax, that's the guy that finished uh, in the top five and, uh, and capped off yeah. – four all America finishes. That's, and nobody's talking about him. That just really kind of shows uh, what, what this program is where that guy can fly under the radar. But uh, yeah, there, there's, there's going to be uh, some movement. Uh, there's going to be a transfer. Uh, somebody uh, is uh, frankly going to have their feelings hurt. Um, I feel like uh, we'll see mm. who that is. Uh, but I think this off season is going to be uh, maybe the more intriguing off season. One of the more intriguing off seasons, Penn state wrestling some, um, ever had and uh mm -hmm. the simple fact is you're also likely for sure replacing one and likely replacing another four-time national champ so you gotta see how you uh manage and respond from that too and with and just imagine joe if all of those those three guys bartlett starachi and kirkley do happen to come back and are in that lineup for next season right that's why i just said Penn yep. State wrestling, oh, they broke the team scoring record. They got four individual champs, a 100-point deficit. That could all be shattered again in 12 months from now. <laughs> yeah, and we, we didn't even mention um another class of 2024 guy who could make an impact is Connor Mirasola. Uh, that's a guy that yeah, could the score Mirasola twins. Yes. Uh, given uh, what, given Cal hit, how, uh, Cal, how Kale handled Levi Haynes this season and Tyler Kasak, uh, or Levi Haynes last season and Tyler Kasak this year. Um, it doesn't seem like his MO is to kind of throw a true freshman in there right away and have him as a day one starter. I think they're a little uh, cautious and maybe mm -hmm. by the end of January or so, they'll have that red shirt um, burned. Uh, that's kind of how they've been playing it with Kasak and Haynes uh, and whatever. Um, I don't know what they're going to do with Lily Dale and Mirasola, but maybe right. – both of those guys will be similar cases next year. Uh, but yeah, this is this is a very good recruiting class Penn State has coming in. And the next one uh, with Asher Cunningham, son of Casey Cunningham, uh, yep. will be very good. And, you know, the next generation's uh, going to come. Uh, we'll see uh, how we'll see how long it takes uh, those guys uh, to become mm -hmm. regular uh, stables of Penn State starting lineup. But uh, yeah, it, it's going to be fun one way or the other. He's Joe Smeltzer, beat reporter for Nittany Sports Now. You can check out that website, nittanysportsnow.com. Also follow Joe on X. And if you like what we do here on Locked on Nittany Lions, subscribe, like this episode, share it with friends and family, and leave a comment to let us know what you think about the NCAA Finals wrapping up and next year's potential lineup. Joe, thanks so much for the time. Can't wait to talk some wrestling in the not-too-distant future as the season's all done here. But uh, this was great. I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to come chat some Penn State Wrestling on this show. You bet. Thanks, Zach.